In Florida, there's a special lab studying lightning. ABC's Bill Blakemore went to pay a visit. At any one moment, there are about 2,000 electrical storms on our planet. It's a constantly crackling ball of lightning, about 100 volts a second. Striking people, houses, power lines, airplanes. Uh, normal commercial plane about twice a year. A given plane? Yeah. Every Electrical engineer Martin Newman is in league with Jove himself. His 100-acre lab in Florida is plugged into the biggest source of electricity there is. This is the only full-service lightning study center. One experiment here, how to protect planes. They rarely crash when they're hit, but their navigation systems can get knocked out by a lightning bolt's current. We can map the whole electric and magnetic field uh, that a plane would be bathed in. Everything's attached to Human pulls thunderbolts down from the sky by firing rockets, each trailing a wire as high as the Empire State Building. The wire attracts lightning from miles up that follows it back to the ground. Starting countdown. Five, four, three, two, one, fire. High-speed cameras capture each microsecond, revealing not just one stroke, but a second, then a third and fourth, and a rare glimpse of a beaded effect that's still a mystery to science. But they did measure the electricity right next to the lightning bolt, vital data for redesigning airplane wiring for bad weather. There's some storms in the Midwest that have produced nearly 100 lightnings a second. Human's experiments have already helped to protect runway lights from lightning. He's also hitting power lines with lightning, learning to protect them. And he's built this house, which he's hitting with lightning, to discover ways to make your wiring safer. That's a, one of the intents is to make sure that we can have a safe house, that you can sit in here and watch TV while we, while we strike it with lightning. Right. But don't try this on your house. It's better to leave these experiments fire to the experts. Bill Blakemore, ABC huh? News, at the University of Florida's Lightning Center. All right! Lightning! Near Gainesville. Electrostatics, and we got a million questions. So, what's lightning, for example? What causes it? Does it originate from the ground, or does it originate from the clouds? Most who are struck by lightning, do they live or do they die? How about lightning and lightning? Where does it come from? How about the heat? How about the sound? Why does a negatively charged comb attract light and water? Is that because the water is positively charged? Speaking of something being positive and negatively charged, where do we get this? What does it mean for something to be positive and negatively charged? Where do we get these charges from if that's the case? Just about each and every single airplane gets struck by lightning twice per year on average. Why then do we remain perfectly safe on the inside? Why is that? Is that because the insulation between us and the metal of the airplane? Is that because that doesn't allow us to actually touch the inside of the airplane? What would happen to us if we were in direct contact with the metal of the airplane from the inside? Would we get shot? Something totally what would it take to kill someone wasn't just using my person? Would we get killed if we were sitting on top of the airplane while it's being struck by lightning by any chance? Would that be dangerous? Would that be deadly? How about those plastic wraps that we use to secure our food? And why are they so sticky when it comes to glass and porcelain and not so much with metal pots? What makes them stick? What makes them so sticky? Jerry, you should have bought Glad cling wrap. Glad unrolls smooth and easy and clings tight when you need it to. Comes out easy? Yep. And clings tight? Absolutely. Hello, Glad cling wrap. Don't get mad. Get Glad. Glad cling wrap. How about high ground versus the low ground during lightning? Which one is more likely to be struck by lightning? You're thinking high ground. If that's the case, why then are the tallest structures are not the ones that get hit by lightning all the time in cities like Chicago? 
So we got question after question after question. And these are the questions that we will get to investigate. Let's start from the beginning and focus on the guy whose picture is on a hundred dollar bill. Why Ben Franklin? Why is his picture on a hundred dollar bill? Was he ever a president? No. Did he have any significant contributions that made him worthy enough to have his picture on a hundred dollar bill? He must have. So, what's that contribution? What are the contributions for that man? Does that have anything to do with the story of him flying a kite in an electrical storm? Then a made up story, or did he really do that? If he did it, what would have been the purpose of it? Franklin also had numerous contributions to science, including the lightning rod we still use today as a lightning prevention measure. In fact, Franklin was recognized as one of the best physicists in his time to, to an extent that he was awarded the Copley Medal. Copley Medal back then had the same prestige that Nobel Prize is today. So, going back to the same question. Why do we have his picture on the dollar bill if not for his science? Franklin's curious mind now becomes intrigued by one of the great scientific mysteries of the 18th century. The phenomenon of electricity. Never in my life has anything so totally engrossed me. While I was making experiments and then repeating them for my friends and acquaintances who come in crowds to see them, I don't have a moment for anything else. In Franklin's day, electricity was much more of a puzzle than gravity had been a century earlier in Newton's time. Everybody was familiar with things falling and all, but electricity, it was just a matter of rubbing something and getting some sparks. Where did this come from? Very mysterious. For Franklin, the pursuit of electricity started as a game. There was an itinerant Englishman who went from town to town showing gadgets that produced scintillas and sparks and could do things. In one popular demonstration, a group of people hold hands and then receive a collective shock from an electrostatic generator. This game is performed by people around the world. With the kind of mind and the curiosity he had, Franklin wanted to go beyond the amusement. The great thing about every one of these parlor tricks, the simple phenomena of attraction, repulsion, was why. Before Franklin, no one had any clue. Franklin puzzles over electricity for almost 10 years. Why is a stream of water attracted to a charged glass rod? Can you kill an animal with an electric shock? In Franklin's time, it was known that the charged objects would either attract each other or repel each other. So the question was the cause of attraction as well as the repulsion. So Franklin thought that this phenomena could easily be understood if he assumed that there are two kinds of charges. And if there are two kinds of charges, then obviously some of these charges are going to be like and some of these charges are going to be unlike. He figured that the unlike charges would attract, the opposites would attract, as we say today, and then the like charges would repel. How did Franklin come up with the idea of a positive charge and a negative charge? How did that come about? At the time, everyone assumed that electricity was some mysterious force created by rubbing two different substances together. Through experimentation, Franklin proves that in fact, the friction does not create electricity, it simply moves a charge from one body to another. When these charged bodies are brought close together, the result is a spark. Electricity flowing through the air. This theory was based on the concept of an electric fluid, like an electric current, and that this could exist in bodies in a surplus or a deficiency. He called one state plus or positive and the other minus or negative. 
Before Franklin, people had no idea what electricity was or how it worked. After Franklin's fundamental insight, the phenomenon of electricity could be understood and harnessed as a force to change the world. In Franklin's time, the electricity was that of a fluid. Surplus state of the fluid would be the positive state. The deficient state was known as the negative state. So the electricity would flow, electrical flow, electrical fluid would flow from a positive state towards the negative state. As far as Franklin was concerned, the electric charges would repel each other, which means that positive charges would repel positive charges, the negative charges would repel negative charges, and opposite charges would attract, so which means that the positive charges would be attracted to negative charges, and so forth. Today, we know that these charges are particles. Positive charges make up the center of an atom, which is known as the nucleus and the negative charges move about the center of the atom, and those are known as the electrons. So positive charges are known as protons, the negative charges are known as electrons. Each and every single atom contains equal number of positive and negative charges, and they're known to be neutral. All right, so here's the classical atom. You have the positive charge right at the center, and you have the negative charge, or charges moving about the center. Okay, E means unit charge. Unit charges could be positive or negative. So you have positive unit charges and you got negative unit charges. Positive unit charge is known as a proton. The negative unit charge is known as an electron. Unit charge is gonna have a value which is extremely small. This is gonna be 10 to minus 19 Coulomb. C is gonna be Coulomb. Coulomb is the name of a Frenchman who's got some significant contribution in electrostatics. The value of a unit charge, positive or negative, is this. It's 1.602 times 10 to minus 19 Coulomb. First measured here in Chicago in 1905 by someone named Robert Millikan who won the Nobel Prize in 1923. All right, so that's a unit charge. So you got positive charges, you got positive unit charges, you got negative unit charges. And the unit charges are gonna be found inside atoms. All right, so speaking of charges, let's get back to the lecture. These charges cannot be created or destroyed. <laughs> Smallest unit charge, the negative one that you can have, is an electron, according to classical physics. And you cannot break electron into something smaller than itself. Alright, so the charges cannot be destroyed, they cannot be created. If charges cannot be created or destroyed, the question is, how do we charge things up? positively or negatively. Comb, attracting water, that comb was negatively charged. Let's talk about the net charge briefly. Net charge in this case is Q. Net charge simply means the sum total, total number of charges that you have. Imagine that this is plastic and somehow, magically, we're able to drop four negative charges on it. So net charge is again negative four, E, E being a unit charge. So lowercase n represents the number of charges that we have, and that's it.